Hey everyone, I'm Megyn Kelly. Welcome to The Megyn Kelly Show. Well, last night was night two of the Democratic National Convention, and the Democrats rolled out their biggest stars, their heaviest hitters, Michelle and Barack Obama, who were clearly put on Tuesday to enthuse their voters, but also to keep them far enough away from Kamala's remarks on Thursday that no one's thinking about the contrast in ability. <laughs> and boy, do the Obamas have ability. They are great speakers, great, at least on prompter. They can read speeches, other people wrote for them, with all of the appropriate dramatics, tone, moments of emphasis. And it helps when you start out already, already a god before the audience that you are addressing, right? You go in there with such goodwill, they're ready. Whatever you say, you could have been like, you know, pineapple, pineapple. <laughs> They'd be cheering the same way. Uh, but they were substantive. That, that you can't take away. Whether they were truthful is a different story. Um, and of course, the obvious dynamic there last night was that many of the problems they were lamenting went unsolved and were even exacerbated during Barack Obama's eight years as president. Not to mention later again when his vice president, Joe Biden, became the top dog. All right, Michelle Obama is going to be my focus. We'll get to Obama, Barack Obama, too. But let's just start with Michelle. She was the star. With all due respect to Barack Obama, who's no slouch when it comes to oratory, she was the star. Normally, you have to pay three quarters of a million dollars to hear her read a speech. But last night, we got her for free. And she started out with a hefty dose of honesty. We're feeling it here in this arena, but it's spreading all across this country. We love a familiar feeling that's been buried too deep for far too long. You know what I'm talking about. It's the contagious power of hope. The anticipation, the energy, the exhilaration of once again being on the cusp of a brighter day. The chance to vanquish the demons of fear, division, and hate that have consumed us. America, hope is making a comeback. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't seem like she's been enjoying the Biden-Harris year so much. You're not alone, Michelle. <laughs> but why? Why is she feeling so hopeless? Honestly, sincere question. Why is Michelle Obama so hopeless? This multimillionaire who went to Princeton and Harvard Law School, who became first lady of the United States, who thought so much of herself, she called her own memoir becoming, becoming, double entendre, get it? That she's she's hopeless? Uh, makes sense. And she said it wasn't until her husband was nominated for president that she'd ever felt proud of her country. So she's got a bit of a negative Nelly problem privately. It seems unless Michelle and Barack are being actively adored, uh, and, and lavished with praise and accomplishments, she gets a little bitter. Then she ended any doubt that Barack Obama was maneuvering behind the scenes to oust Joe Biden, which we knew, but they haven't admitted it explicitly. This is as close as we're going to get. Take a listen to how she's been feeling about Mr. Biden's candidacy. To be honest, I am realizing that until recently, I have mourned the dimming of that hope. And maybe you've experienced the same feelings. Is that deep pit in my stomach? A palpable <laughs> sense of dread about the future? Oh, wow. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Michelle. <laughs> sure, that's what the Bidens were thinking. Not exactly a ringing endorsement of our sitting president. And what are the odds, for those of you still wondering what hand Obama had in, in this coup or this ouster, that Michelle Obama kept her feelings to herself? or that her husband didn't share in them, or that her husband saw Joe Biden's chances as absolutely terrific. All right, anyway, they're happy now. Joyful, even. Word of the night, of the convention, of the election. Joyful, and of course, on brand, hopeful. They are the party of hope and joy. Hope and joy, got it? Pay no attention to the babies being aborted outside of their convention. That's also hopeful and joyful. She tried to set herself up as someone we can all relate to just a working class girl from the south side of Chicago who comes from a line of people suspicious of rich fat cats. Listen to this bit about her mom. You see 
see, my mom, in her steady, quiet way, lived out that striving sense of hope every single day of her life. She believed that all children, all, all people have value, that anyone can succeed if given the opportunity. She and my father didn't aspire to be wealthy. In fact, they were suspicious of folks who took more than they needed. Folks who took more than they needed. Sounds kind of communist-y, Michelle. Later in the speech, she accused Republicans of, quote, prioritizing building their wealth over ensuring that everyone has enough. See, Michelle and Kamala want to decide when you have enough. How much wealth is enough for you? And it's not until others have enough. But in America, we encourage people to work hard on the promise that anything is possible. The American dream is you can make more of your life than you started out with. There's no addendum that says, once you have what, quote, you need, what the government deems, quote, enough, you need to stop, per the U.S. government. This is just like her husband. Remember Joe the Plumber in 2008? That story dominated the news cycle for weeks, months even. Poor Joe died and early death at age 49 years later. But in 2008, he was the news cycle because he confronted Barack Obama on a rope line about the fact that he worked very hard for over a decade to build his business. And now that he was just starting to edge up, he was looking at, at expanding, uh, he was about to get hit with a Barack Obama tax, an additional tax increase. And they had this exchange on a rope line uh, and where he asked Barack Obama, then candidate Barack Obama, about this tax hike, and Obama defended his tax hike, saying he wants to spread the wealth around. He wanted plumbers like Joe to pay for other people. Barack Obama later admitted on camera that, quote, I do think at a certain point you've made enough money. That's how these people think. They, they, they adorn this principle in nice language, like we need to make sure everyone has enough. And what they mean is they need to take money from the people who have worked hard and succeeded and give it. To others who may not have worked hard in comparison, who may have not have done anything. Yes, there may be some people who have fallen on hard times and we have a social safety net for them. But this mindset is a little socialistic. That's the truth. And that's why Tim Walls, by the way, is the perfect running mate for Kamala. So how much, how much is enough money, according to the Obamas? 70 million? Because public reports estimate that that is their net worth parlayed on the back of Barack Obama's 14 years of holding political office. He did not spend 50 years in government service. He did a stint in the Illinois State Senate. He did a couple years in the U.S. Senate before he ran for office and won. All right, and then he did two terms as president. And off of that, he's made himself over $100 million, almost $100 million, probably over, to be honest. We don't know all of the earnings. The Obamas reportedly own four, count them, four luxury properties. A home in Martha's Vineyard, estimated to be worth some 20 million bucks. In addition to properties in Washington, D.C., reportedly bought for $8.1 million, a beachfront home in Hawaii, reportedly bought for $8.7 million, and a home bought in Chicago for $1.65 million. Is that more than you need, Mr. Obama, Mrs. Obama? Now, Michelle does not like Donald Trump, and for this, I cannot blame her. But the cluelessness of her main attack against him was palpable. Speaking about Kamala, and she was doing the contrast between Trump and Kamala. Michelle said that she understands, Kamala understands, that most of us will never be afforded the grace of failing forward. Kamala knows that. She literally just got elevated to the nominee for president after not winning a single primary in a country in which she has record low approval ratings and in which most of her own party, including you, reportedly Michelle, did not want her or think she could handle the job of president. It feels a little like failing forward to me. Michelle went on saying Kamala, unlike Trump, understands that most of us, quote, will never benefit from the affirmative action of generational wealth. You mean like your kids who definitely got into their Ivy League schools thanks entirely to their own merit? I'm sure. Unlike Trump, she implied most of us, if we, quote, choke in a crisis, we don't get a second, third, or fourth chance. Tell it to Tim Walls. 
whose brand seems to be choking in a crisis. He cut and ran rather than serve in Iraq with his National Guard unit when they got deployed. And when his largest city, once he was governor of Minnesota, was aflame, thanks to the post-George Floyd riots, he let it burn. Despite the mayor of Minneapolis begging him for National Guard troops, he did not send them because he did not want to upset the rioters. It took days. Is that choking in a crisis and now elevated to the vice presidential nominee, getting a second or a third chance, Michelle? She went on, if things don't go our way, we don't have the luxury of whining to get further ahead. Really? You might want to meet one of the speakers from night one of the convention. Her name is Hillary Clinton, who lost to Trump in 2016 and then spent the next four years saying he was an illegitimate president and that Russia helped him steal the election from her. Or maybe Stacey Abrams, your pal down in Georgia, who all but pretended she was the actual governor of Georgia for years after she lost. Is that the kind of whining that you don't do? Michelle lamented that most of us, quote, don't get to change the rules so we always win. You mean like changing the voting laws in Pennsylvania, the most critical of the critical swing states to allow voting by mail in advance of a presidential election, even though the legislature did not approve of this, and then fighting to get ballots not even postmarked by election day counted as valid votes, that kind of rule changing just to win? Indeed, you're correct, madam, it is annoying. She took a shot at Trump's birtherism claims, and this one was deserved, if over the top. Now, un unfortunately, we know what comes next. We know folks are going to do everything they can to distort her truth. My husband and I sadly know a little something about this. For years, Donald Trump did everything in his power to try to make people fear us. See, his, his limited, narrow view of the world made him feel threatened by the existence of two hardworking, highly educated, successful people who happen to be black. the job he's currently seeking might just be one of those black jobs. Of course, she went too far. Because Trump's reference to black jobs was obviously a short form way of saying he wants to help black Americans find jobs. And let's hope he can do it. Because today's jobs report for all of us, black, white and otherwise, is absolutely dreadful. The U.S. economy created 818 thousand fewer jobs than originally reported in the 12 month period through March of 2024, according to the Labor Department. This just hit. That is the largest downward revision in 15 years. Largest downward revision in 15 years. The Bureau says the actual job growth was nearly 30 percent less than initially reported over the year. So, yeah, black jobs, white jobs, any jobs would be great right now. Doesn't much matter how it's labeled. And you know who created more jobs? Donald Trump, Michelle. She went on to call Trump a con man who is doubling down in this election on, quote, ugly, misogynistic, racist lies. Then she lectured us on the importance of respect, dignity and empathy. And her, her husband later got up there and derided, quote, childish nicknames. So nicknames, bad. Calling someone racist and misogynist, good. That's respectful dignified, empathetic, according to the Obamas. She went on to paint Republicans' efforts to protect minor children, just as they now do in Scandinavia and Europe, by banning the chopping off of children's healthy body parts and the sterilization of minors in the name of, quote, gender-affirming care, as, quote, demonizing our children for being who they are. That's how she phrased it. She said that only makes us small, all of that attempted enforcement of, you know, the consent laws. 
in all of this, in all of this, her soaring speech, her dishonesty, uh, she was found inspirational by that crowd, which was on its feet in adoration. And that is where Michelle is in her sweet spot. Misleading, attacking Republicans, ripping the foundational ideals of America, and finding herself, once again, the subject of Democrats' worship. Joining me now, the three hosts of The Morning Meeting, a fast-growing interactive show on the Two-Way YouTube channel. Mark Halperin is editor-in-chief of Two-Way. Sean Spicer is a former White House press secretary and host of The Sean Spicer Show. And Tim Hogan is a Democratic political consultant. Don't miss a moment. Subscribe to this show on YouTube and follow me on Insta, Facebook, and X. In these crazy times, there's peace of mind in security. Security for our country, for our leaders, and for our families. But think about this. You're not financially secure if all of your eggs are in one basket. Gold and silver can be an excellent way to diversify your savings as a hedge against inflation. They are a physical asset that's in high demand globally. And through Birch Gold Group, you can own physical gold and silver in a tax-sheltered retirement account. Yes, you can diversify an old IRA or 401k for no money out of pocket into an IRA in gold and silver. Text MK to 989898 and receive a free no-obligation info kit and learn the role precious metals could play in your overall savings strategy. Again, text MK to 989898. Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and thousands of happy customers. Text MK to 989898. Message and data rates may apply. Guys, welcome to the show. Great to have you back. Uh, Mark, I'll start with you. What did you make of Michelle and Barack? Just one small correction. Tim is also America's sweetheart. Um, <laughs> I thought I thought most telling for me was I watched Flipped Around After uh, and on Fox, uh, Dana Perino and Brit Hume were swooning over them. They had some nitpicks, but they were swooning. They're technically very proficient. As you said, they can read slash deliver a speech as well as anybody. They have huge star power. If there were if there were a thumbs up and thumbs down in the hall and I watched from the floor, it'd be lots of thumbs up, probably unanimous. I have no idea what battleground state voters will think of it to the extent they hear about it or have watched it. And there's some reason to believe that they helped her become president of the Democratic Party. They helped Kamala Harris become president of the Democratic Party. Less obvious, although not impossible, they helped her actually become president. Yeah, um, no question it went over huge in the room. And I have to say, I know Dana and Britt, and I think they were reacting to what I outlined at the top of my remarks. She's an excellent speaker, so is he. There's no better. I mean, the Democrat Party has two superstars in these two, and they start off absolutely beloved. But Sean, you get down to substance, and this is why I focused in just on hers, but we'll get to his too. It starts to fall apart pretty quickly. Yeah, I thought your monologue was spot on. The bottom line is, I mean, she's talking about the theme that Kamala Harris has been pushing, this idea of socialism and communism. We want people to come to America to live the American dream, to succeed, to do well for them, to prosper, to build a business, to work for a company that they want to and take care of their family. And she's out there telling people, Well, you only get as much as you need, and then we'll take the rest. At the same time, as you pointed out, her net worth is over $70 million, four houses. God bless them. Good for them. I have no problem with it. I do agree with you. It's a little interesting how they made their money, but that's another subject. But the bottom line is is that I want everyone in America to do well. I want them to lift themselves up. I want them to get an opportunity. But she wants one thing for her and one thing for everyone else. And it's a common theme. I thought last night was very schizophrenic. You got Bernie Sanders on there being like, we need health care for all in public financing. And then you got her <laughs> demonizing this, Doug Emhoff making, I thought, a good speech. I did, I, I was like a whiplash night of messaging. All right, Tim, where am I going wrong in my take on Michelle Obama? <laughs> Uh, Look, that was like 15 minutes to start with, so I don't know that I have 15 minutes to respond. Look, I think there is a a point here that we have record levels of inequality in America. We have a social safety net, but there are tons of holes in that social safety net, whether it's families struggling with child care, whether it is being able to care for elder parents and elderly care and how expensive that is, day-to-day costs. Look, you can be a successful person, to Sean's point, in America, uh, and then look back down the ladder 
be thankful for how successful you were and say this system has to be better. That's what we trust our public officials to do. So I think it's very hard to begrudge the success of someone um, as a point to say, well, you can't call for government intervention to uh, have a social program that that helps people, that provides daycare, that provides child care, uh, that provides health care to people. And I think we get to this esoteric level where any type of government intervention feels like socialism or communism. I'm just not sure people buy that. People have a lived experience where they're struggling day to day and they want to hear people like the former president and Michelle Obama see and understand and weave their story, their narrative, how they grew up, who their parents were, what their life was like, and they see that reflected back to them. I think that's that's why that speech was so effective. Megan, can I make yeah. one, one quick point, though? I mean, and Tim yeah. suggested this. People are struggling out there. Michelle Obama talking about hope returning. And I'm like, does anyone know who's in the White House right now? <laughs> She's there. She is in the White House. She's the vice president. And these guys are acting like a bunch of Republicans are in charge. They're in charge of the White House. It is their policies that have put us here. And last night was a was sort of an attempt to make people forget who's running the country. I get they pushed Biden out of the way, but she's the vice president. She's a partner. And these are her policies. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, I just guys, I, 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 yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just no, going to say, don't. like, it, you know, the, the project is not over, right, because we have the White House. We didn't pass all the policies we wanted to. Republicans have a very easy agenda when they're in power because they put conservative judges, uh, you know, they they use they run them through the Senate. Uh, they do tax cuts uh, through reconciliation. It's I would love to be a Republican. It's so easy to make the government not work. Just throw sand in the gears. But Tim, it's so easy. But Tim, that's not that's not Sean's point. Sean's point is the Obamas are known for audacity. And that was quite a bit of audacity to basically say this it was a central theme of her speech. Things are so hopeless now. Right. They're so hopeless. Right. Hope is coming back. And look over there. The number two person in charge of hope apparently isn't doing that good a job, but she'd like a promotion. That <laughs> I think that is the I think that is more on the speech. I think it's more about the looming cloud of Donald Trump is what I would say. I think that's what she was alluding to. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's why I split up her remarks, because she seemed to hit it in two different ways, which m led me to believe that the first negative N Nelly moment was about where we are right now. And the new hope is thanks to Kamala coming in. Um, but Barack Obama's the his whole speech seemed to really be about the government is here to help you like we need more government. And one of his regrets when he spoke up there was and I'll quote um, he's worried that this is a country where too many Americans are still struggling where a lot of Americans don't believe government can help. And he says, as we're gathering here, people are asking, who will fight for me? Who's thinking about my future, about my children's future? But our, no one, no one, Mr. President, this is America. We're, it's not a nanny state. You, you worry about your kids. You worry about yourself. The government is there to help the people who fall the lowest. And we do that in America. But no, the answer is I am not thinking about you or your kids. And I don't want you, government, thinking about me or mine. All I could think of when I listened to Barack Obama the whole night, the whole speech, was this guy, um, Sot Six. I've always felt the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Sean, do you feel me? Yeah, I, I just... I, like I said, I felt like to, like this has been off. I feel like they've set up a convention that was for Biden. They kicked him out and they were like, uh, we'll have we'll change some signs. But 70 percent of Americans don't know who Kamala Harris really is or what they stand for. I, I will give credit to Doug Emhoff. He gave a great speech. I felt like if I if I didn't know what I know about Kamala Harris, I'd like to meet her after the description that he gave last night. She seems like a very nice person. They need more Doug Emhoff and less Barack Obama. Barack Obama gave this okay, almost like, very here's what I regret not doing speech. I got to be can honest. I, can I unleash Doug, my... Doug Emhoff, yes, I'll bring you one second more. But uh, Doug Emhoff was a, like a sweet guy when he was speaking up there, like his affect, he clearly loves Kamala, that's nice. But I have to be honest with you, all I could think about was the first wife story. I'm looking at him and the Democrats tweeted out from their like elect Kamala Harris tw Twitter account, um, who would have thought when he met Kamala Harris years ago, he'd be marrying the future president of the United States. And all I can think was not his first wife on whom he cheated with the nanny, creating some love child who is either <laughs> aborted or is fatherless at the moment. Like, why would you send out that tweet? All I could think of when I was looking at him was about this news story. 
I just, I got to be honest, I probably wouldn't have used him had I been running the Democratic National Committee. I probably would have used like somebody else. They did use a couple of people to tell nice stories about Kamala. That was good. I appreciated that. But I don't think he was the guy, even though but Megan, he's likable. I mean, here's the question that I have too for fresh. you. Do you think the, the, the media is not going to let us know? You know that. And your audience knows that. I know that. But I think that the mainstream legacy media has done everything to cover up anything negative about not just Doug Emhoff, Kamala Harris, Tim Waltz. And I, I agree with you. I mean, that's the real Doug Emhoff. But the speech last night, this whole thing has been about presenting people who really aren't who they say they are, right? I mean, that's the Tim Waltz story. That's what's going on now. And I, I will say, again, knowing if you didn't know anything and you just woke up, which is what I think a lot of Americans who are finally tuning in are doing right now, the media is presenting a case for these people that is completely oblivious to the reality of who they truly are. But it's not a bad story to have if you're going to get one told about you. Mark, what were you going to say yeah, on before that I point, interrupted? Home, uh, 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 that's okay. On Sean's just point, Sean just made having home court advantage and the referees on your side is a great thing, and so they're able to get away with myth making that the Republicans would be called on. It's just a reality. Um, uh, let me unleash my unleash my inner Doris Kearns Goodwin for just a second. Barack Obama did things as president that Bill Clinton would never have dreamed of doing because they were way too progressive. Joe Biden has done things that Barack Obama would never dream to have done because he thought that the, the traffic wouldn't bear it. It would be too risky for a Democrat to do it. Kamala Harris has already proposed in her limited proposals, price controls on groceries. Joe Biden would never have gone for that. And so what was left unspoken last night, Barack Obama acted like there was a through line between his economic philosophy and Kamala Harris's, and there just isn't. Mm -hmm. The party has moved really far to the left since Barack Obama, and he's, he's not gonna say that, but that's the that's the project for the Trump campaign to say, you guys may have thought Barack Obama was really liberal on economics. This is a whole different thing. Go yeah. ahead, Tim. But can I just say, like, there is there is no clear message from the Trump campaign on how they are trying to paint Kamala Harris. And it comes from the top down. And I think that's why Republicans haven't found their footing is because Donald Trump goes off at every rally that he's talking about, says he's entitled to personal insults. But like what what is the point here? Is it that Kamala Harris is a continuation of Joe Biden, who is more centrist? Is it Kamala Harris is a leftist uh, from California? Um, is it that Kamala Harris, she is a chameleon, you don't know who she's going to be? I just don't think that the Trump campaign has a message to land it. And on top of that, you have Trump who just wants to prosecute the case against Biden. He can't he can't let it go. So um, all you know, of that look, is true. I, 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 Everything you just yeah. said well, is true. <laughs> <laughs> all of the Thank above. you. Yeah. A, a right. B, C and D. Yeah, it's true. That that is that is one of the major problems that the Republicans are suffering from right now. Um, and I don't know that they've solved it. I mean, they're uh, in their defense. They're a little new to fighting Kamala Harris. This whole thing happened pretty quickly. But you're used to Trump finding the way in on a defining somebody earlier, sooner and more effectively than he has here. So, you know, we'll see whether they eventually get there. Um, I do want to play this clip from Doug Hemhoff because he decided. <sighs> This was his attempt to get us to love Kamala. And I've got to tell you, it did not land for me. I was like, I was waiting for a bigger conclusion and it didn't land bigly. Here's this moment. I'll, I, don't, I don't want to give away too much. Sot 13. A few days ago, during this incredible time we're going through, there was a brief window when Kamala was back at home. And I saw her sitting on her favorite chair and in the middle of a wild month, I just hoped that she was having a, a quiet moment to herself. But then I realized she was on the phone. And of course, my, met, my mind went to all the potential crises that the vice president could be dealing with. Was it domestic? Was it foreign? Was it campaign? I could see she was focused. And all I knew was that it must be something important. And it turns out it was. Ella had called her. That's Kamala. That's Kamala. Tim, I'm sorry, but like, so she took a phone call from her stepdaughter. What? How about like, uh, call Nobel? Was she, like, get her on the short list. What was that about? 
I mean, look, I, I will say I think Doug Emhoff's speech was very good because you need to put, and I, you know, like as a spouse, the way that they've uh, and, and the kids that they are raising together in a blended family and the way that they tell that story um, and how Doug's previous wife has talked about how good Kamala is as a parent. I think there is a strong familial story there just to push back on, on what you said earlier. But look, this is about humanization, right? It's about not just seeing this person as someone who is running for vice president or someone who was a DA or an attorney general. There's a message to communicate there in paid advertising. She's tough, tough, tough. Uh, that is obviously something they're leaning into. But we haven't heard a speech like that from a validator, from a character witness who knows and has lived with Kamala Harris and has a lived experience with Kamala Harris. And it's just about making her real, about connecting but, but her. But let me, let me just interrupt. Let, so let me interrupt and I'll important. give you back the floor. Here's why it didn't work for me. If, if it had been like a really like Ella was down. Ella had just had this massive disappointment. Ella, you know who she reached out to? Kamala. And Kamala was in the middle of taking the phone call, you know, uh, from Barack Obama saying she was now the nominee. And she said, Mr. President, I can't speak to you now. Ella's here. And she need. OK, now I'm with you. It was like she spoke on the phone with Ella. <laughs> who gives yeah. a shit? But it was like it her was intense. Just, I think it's like her intense focus, right? Her, her, her like love for her kids. I think that is what he was going for. You know, whether you, you thought that was good or not. We can stipulate that was not the best story in his speech, but and we don't know how swing voters would feel about it. But I think the whole project is to make her 3D before the Republicans make her, a, you know, a villain. And and I thought for a guy who has not given a lot of huge speeches, just a matter of presentation, it was so authentic sounding. It was so casual. It was so conversational, and people were leaning in. I was on the floor, and again, they're not the most you know neutral audience. But it was it was a well told story, and not everybody can do that, and that's you know effective speech making. Tim, what do you make of the fact that the Obamas went on Tuesday, and now tonight, Wednesday, we get Bill Clinton? Obviously, Tim Walls goes tonight too. But Bill Clinton, you know, if you're just sketching it out on paper, you would say Bill Clinton goes on Tuesday, and the Obamas go on Wednesday. They're more recent, they're bigger stars. You know, Hillary went on Monday. That made sense. Uh, my theory, as I said in the opening, is they did not want those two great orators too close to the main event. It would just be too dramatic a contrast. Oh, I don't know. Um, I mean, I think it's not necessarily chronological. You look at the way that they've done uh, Monday through Thursday here. Um, and I think, look, it is about spreading out the energy, right? And I do think what we've seen from Kamala Harris on the stump, we're going to get an obvious updated version of that on Thursday. But she's been electric. It is it is very different. And I think this is a problem for Republicans, too, is they really want to run against the Kamala Harris also of 2019. They want to look backwards and want to just look at every every policy that she rolled out in a 29 person Democratic primary use that they want to look at any of the verbal flubs or gaffes that she made back in 2019 and say, that's who she is now. And I don't know if that is to take <laughs> comfort in it, but that is not who she is now. That that, oh, is, not the, that is not the delivery of know? the speeches that we're saying. Well, what have I mean, you like, seen look that we haven't seen? Stump. Look, look, look at her on the stump. She's she has gone and talked to reporters at Gaggles. Look, an interview's coming. End of August. Oh, We've been promised. Please. It's happening. It's happening. Is, is, um, it, is it with Jen Psaki? Is, is it with Jen Psaki? Yeah, but she is performing better, <laughs> is my point. Is she, has, she is meeting the moment in a way, and I think that is also part of the reason you're seeing a lot of energy from Democrats while they've raised $500 million, is, is she is meeting the moment. The money, the money's big. It's very helpful. I will say, and I, I know this is not a unique thought, the DJ playing the music during the roll call was absolutely brilliant. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was like the one time you're you're really entertained by the roll call. What I saw in the various states when they actually did their roll call was a different story. <laughs> Thinking about you, New Jersey, my where I am right now, I could have done we could have done better, in New Jersey. Um, so that was good, and I actually predict that will be the norm. It was so good that'll be the norm in every convention hereafter because it was just so electric and energizing, and the DJ was great, uh, and they had Lil John there playing. So it was like I, the Democrats do. They do pomp and circumstance very well. And I do think that is that is a contrast between them and the Republicans, Sean. I mean, I, you got to admit, it's just, yeah, they're very good at it. I, I would say nine times out of 10, that's true. This past convention that the Republicans put together, I thought was hands down the best overall performance of any convention that I've seen in modern history. So there are bits and pieces that I'm sure the Democrats will excel at. And that's why you have Jeffrey Katzenberg and Steven Spielberg and the rest of Hollywood. The, the benefit of them. But That's when helpful. I walked away from that Republican convention, the goal is is to to get people excited about voting for your ticket and your team. 
And I think the Republicans, when I walked out of there, the energy was, ex- you know, there was enthusiasm, excitement. People were fired up, ready to go. Obviously, that's pre Kamala getting pushed in. But the bottom line is, as I said last night, I felt schizophrenic. I'm like, what are you guys for? You haven't really explained who she is. You haven't told me what you're for. I I get that they might have bits and pieces of really well-produced Hollywood kind of themed events and moments. But net net, I still think that this year's now in the past, you're absolutely right. It was kind of boring and stale. But this year, I think they added an element of excitement and difference. I mean, you know, Hulk Hogan, Dana White, and they aren't A-list celebrities. I'll give you that. But it added an element of, of showmanship that is a little bit more of the Donald Trump era. Mm, I, Let me say, I if I could say, say something about yeah, that too. Ahead, a bit. I was on the floor for a lot of both conventions. And the Republican convention, as Sean said, was extremely well produced. I thought they incorporated the band really well. Um, if they do want to do something special with the roll call I, I, in 2028, they should have hee-haw do picking and a grinning rather than the DJ. I think that would better <laughs> fit the party. Here are two problems with the Democratic event. And again, I'm watching it in the hall, so I don't know how it is on TV. But you want high energy in the hall. First of all, I see this every four years. Democrat Republicans sit and they pay attention to all the speakers and they react looking at them. The Democrats are there for have a party. And so they're they're literally some of them aren't facing the speakers. They're chatting. They're taking selfies. They're on their phone. They're running after people. It's much less focused on the program. And that dilutes the energy. The other thing is the audio in the hall is not very good if you're if you're further back. So where I was for for Doug Emhoff's speech, all the way in the back of the hall, the delegates around me were really having trouble making out what he was saying. And that, again, dilutes the energy. In the Republican convention, the audio is great everywhere. And obviously, audio is a huge thing here. So it's not it's not you say they're, you know, Spielberg and Hollywood and all that. They are having some technical issues that I think are affecting the energy level, at least in the hall. They're not as good at the live events, but they're making sure the screen looks good. They're good at. Um, I did think this was interesting. There was a report from Fox News. Uh, that Kamala Harris was not in the hall last night. She was actually uh, back in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where the RNC had its uh, convention because, because it was weird, when Doug Emhoff, her her husband spoke, she wasn't there. And then Barack and Michelle, the Dem superstars, she wasn't there. It was like, well, wait, where is she? She was there on night one. And the report by Fox News was, Jackie Henrich, I, I believe, was that um, she intentionally did not go because of the rift between Barack Obama and Joe Biden, that it would have been seen as a betrayal of Joe Biden to be there while Barack Obama, the man who stuck the knife in, the Brutus of the story, got up there and celebrated his good work. And so she peaced out and went to Wisconsin for the whole thing. Here was Barack Obama trying to massage those ruffled feathers sought for. At a time when the other party had turned into a cult of personality. We needed a leader who was steady and brought people together and was selfless enough to do the rarest thing there is in politics, putting his own ambition aside for the sake of the country. History will remember Joe Biden as an outstanding president who defended democracy at a moment of great danger. And I am proud to call him my president, but I am even prouder to call him my friend. All right, Mark, you're the one with the inside scoop on this whole drama since it started. So what did you make of that? I don't, I don't think the Fox report is accurate from what I know. The Democrats chose a, a convent to have a convention in a battlegroundless state. This is not a battleground, Illinois. It is bluer than no. blue. They didn't go to Atlanta because of union issues. They had the convention here because the hotels are mostly union. And I think what they were doing was trying to make a play in Wisconsin because that's one of seven states that will decide who wins. I think it's as simple as Wisconsin has electoral votes. So do you, do you reject that there's a rift between Obama and Biden? Oh, no, there is. But I don't think that's why Kamala Harris wasn't here. She, she gave him the marquee position at the convention and they approved the text that allowed uh, particularly Barack Obama to, and, and well, both Barack Obama and Michelle Obama to memory hold the Biden administration. So, so what do you think, I, I Sean? Don't, I don't was, think that she, they, was, she was just busy trying to win votes in Wisconsin on the second night of her convention. I think it was convenient scheduling, put it that way. And if that was a bonus of it, 
all you know good for her. But I do think that the issue that you're touching on, look, it she, what Michelle Obama, I mean, she politically shivved him last night, saying that hope is we need to restore hope. I mean, this the rift is real. Barack Obama pushed him out in 2016 for the first time, and he did it again this year. Right. This is this is a real thing. Joe Biden feels slighted. There's no question about it. And I think, you know, it's not just him. But you think about what they did to him the first night. This is the sitting president of the United States. And the guy doesn't take stage until after 1130 at p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is in, I mean, they have snubbed and disrespected this guy after all of that he's done for them. It's pretty unbelievable. The rift is real. And it's probably growing bigger every night that he has to stew and sit there in, in California and watch it. All right, here, speaking Megan, of do you disrespect. Know the honorary, yeah, go ahead. The honorary chair of the Democratic National Committee is football legend Al Davis. The only premise they're operating on now is just win, baby. And Joe Biden kind of gets that. And most of Joe Biden's aides get that. They'll do anything to try to win this. And if that means shiving the sitting president, if that means showing him disrespect, that's what they'll do. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense when you put it that way. And, and they're good. They're good at winning. They, you know, like I was saying in the opening. And Al, Al, Davis, never lost in Pennsylvania. A, Al Davis never lost a pre- yeah. Al Davis never lost a presidential campaign. I don't know, Al, but, I, but the Democrats, I know, and they've done a very effective job of man- maneuvering at the ballot box in order to win. Um, this was a low moment, Sean, when Barack Obama got up there. And again, we've just been lectured to by his wife about respect and dignity and the return of empathy and all that. And then he doubled down on those same comments. And yet there was this little ditty. And for the listening audience, I'll describe what he does at the end, but take a listen to SOT 5. Here's a 78 year old billionaire who has not stopped whining about his problems since he rode down his golden escalator nine years ago. It has been a constant stream of of gripes and grievances that that's actually been getting worse now that he's afraid of losing to Kamala. There's the childish nicknames, the crazy conspiracy theories, this weird obsession with crowd sizes. Okay, then you had to really see it to appreciate it because it was clearly a reference to Trump's manhood. And Obama was holding his hands out in front of him, almost like dealing with a slide ruler, like bringing him big and then bringing him in tight again. It was a it was a jab at Trump's manhood. That'll make twice that um, in covering the national presidential race on a debate stage or on a presidential uh, convention stage, I've seen a man make a reference to penis size. It happened at the Republican debate uh, in Michigan in 2016 that I was at. That's where Trump kept going like, no, I don't have little hands. I didn't have, I don't have little hands because he got attacked. And now here again, here's the former president of the United States making a D joke in front of a national audience. What did you think of that? I think it's interesting that a, a group of folks that is so outraged by insults and name calling has no problem with name calling and insults. It's just that it's okay when they do it, right? So when they demean somebody, when they call somebody a name, it's okay. When Trump fights back or calls someone a name, it's a problem. So it's just, it's fascinating to me what they get away with. Uh, I don't know why it continues to shock me 10 years later. But at the end of the day, the other thing is, is that I think what attracts so many people to Trump is the authenticity, the ability for him to say and do things that no other politician would. And it's something that most of these guys just don't get. Um, that this poll tested message testing that most politicians get up and spew out is kind of what the opposite of who Trump is. And I think what attracts most people to him. There's somebody asked me today, Megan, it was funny. They said, you know, when he spoke yesterday, it was very scripted. And I go, so let me get this straight. When he's scripted, you have a problem with it. When he's unscripted, you want him more scripted. You guys never seem to know what you want in the media. And they were like, well, I guess that's a fair point. Trump has a uniqueness, and I think he plays to his strengths on that. And and it's just, like I said, ironic that the Democrats have no problem with name calling as long as it's going from their direction outward. Okay, so on that front, Mark, you had yesterday a remarkable incident where Trump appeared. um, Where was it uh, where he got asked, 
Michigan. Okay, it's in Michigan, Howell, Michigan. So he goes to Howell, Michigan, and you got left-wing articles being written about how this is the home of the KKK, the Grand Wizard used to live in, in Howell, and um, now we know it was a Fox News reporter who asked him about those reports, and here's how that went. Who was here in 2021? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Even the cops behind him are laughing at it, Mark. But that's that was an effective way to deal with these personal charges. You know, it's not enough to say his policies are bad. You heard of Barack, Michelle. He's racist. He's misogynistic. He goes to Howell. He's racist. They didn't say that about Joe Biden, but this is what Trump has to deal with. If you're looking for signs of discipline, he did one line, dropped the mic and walked off. So that's a pretty good discipline. And of course, the press knew Joe Biden had been there, had been reported. They wanted to just ignore it. It's another example of the bias that Trump has to deal with. On the insult thing, you referenced the Detroit debate. That's an important antecedent. I'll go back earlier, the White House Correspondents' Dinner, when Barack Obama engaged in a similar attempt to embarrass, uh, humiliate, mock uh, 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 Donald Trump. And I can't tell you for sure, Sean might know better than I do, but I've done reporting on it. I can't say for sure that's what got Donald Trump to run for president and to want to repudiate Barack Obama, but I don't think it hurt. And if Trump wins this race, I bet you he tells us that what happened last night really revved him up to say, I just won't be mocked like that. I'm going to get, I'm going to, you know, rev myself up. You do wonder whether Trump is gearing up right now, because before last night, he actually said, I like Barack Obama and I like his wife. Um, I respect them. And then they got up there yeah. and made fun of his D size and called him names, racist, misogynistic, and so on. I mean, I realize there's a history there that this didn't just start last night, but um, yeah, I don't know. Like when given the opportunity to turn the page, maybe it's nice to, to take it. However, Megan, what, real quick, out, I, can they I want to win. Can I just say t tonight, yeah. tonight is Tim Waltz's night and I will, we're talking about the media coverage. I will be really interested to see how this goes because we saw yesterday and I don't want to, I'm not here to litigate all of these issues, but we've seen the DWI arrest. We've seen issues now with him claiming IVF treatments for his family and his wife that didn't happen the way that he said, and is obviously the military service. And then as you pointed out earlier in the show, how he handled the Minnesota riots. This is a pattern. And I know Axios likes to call it gaffes, but if this were the other side, they call it lying. How they cover Tim Waltz tonight and whether or not they ignore this pattern that we're seeing about from Tim Waltz over and over again, year after year after year, lying, because that's what it is, about aspects of his life will be interesting. Now, I think I know where this ends up. I've seen the movie, <laughs> but I will be interested to see how this plays out. Um, I've got to ask you, we're short on time, about Stephanie Grissom, uh, who worked for you, Sean, when you were at the well, White apparently House. apparently we're out of time now. <laughs> No, no, no. I, I There's want to know your thoughts. There's just enough time to get this in. Boy, talk about shiving him. And honestly, it was an effective shiv. And then with all due respect to Stephanie, you go to her Wikipedia page. Just go to her Wikipedia page. John Pedoritz tweeted it out, so I did it. And I was shocked. Um, I'll play a little bit of what she said. Behind closed doors, Trump mocks his supporters. He calls them basement dwellers. On January 6th, I asked Melania if we could at least tweet that while peaceful protest is the right of every American, there's no place for lawlessness or violence. She replied with one word, no. I became the first senior staffer to resign that day. When I was press secretary, I got skewered for never holding a White House briefing. It's because unlike my boss, I never wanted to stand at that podium and lie. Kamala Harris tells the truth. She respects the American people and she has my vote. Thank you. Sean, you, what did you make of it? And is Stephanie, in your experience, an honest person? Here's what I'll say. Unlike Stephanie, if I have a problem with somebody, I share it with them. I don't air my grievances publicly the way that she chose to. I believe that President Trump gave us an honor by giving us the jobs that he did to serve the American people. And if we have a problem, uh, there's certain ways to deal with it. I, I don't, I would not share the, the method and the tactic that she used. And I also don't 
you, I don't know that that version of Trump, I, I've, I did an entire documentary on the people that follow Trump. I sat down with him. He has great respect for the supporters. Um, so I don't know the person that she described last night. I don't think that that's the way that you handle concerns. And I think that if you're given the honor and the privilege to have a job as I did, and then she subsequently did, uh, if you have a disagreement, you handle it very differently. And I, I think going to the Democratic National Convention and, and, this isn't just a difference. We talked about this for the last 45 minutes. What Kamala Harris and her policies will do to this country, in my opinion, is devastating. And to get up there and say that you're going to support them because you have a personality difference with Donald Trump, to me, mm -hmm. it is a serious uh, lapse in judgment. And I, I, I just I, I think that I, I don't know what people are doing when they do that on the Republican side. These people, they're not coming over to the conservative side. They literally fundamentally want to take this country in a direction that yeah. I find you know, abhorrent. That's obviously a betrayal. Guys, thank you both so much. Up next, a deep dive on mm. Tim Walz. If you're tired of the same old coffee from those mega corporations pushing their woke agendas, listen up. It's time to take a stand and support a brand that truly embodies American values. I'm sick of these woke coffee companies. What's the coffee? Stop it. You want to awake us, but you don't want us to be woke. That's Blackout Coffee's approach. And this is why you need to support them. They stand with hardworking Americans who believe in faith, family, and freedom. They roast some of the most incredible coffee you will ever taste using only premium grade beans roasted and shipped to you within 48 hours. And for the cold brew fans, Blackout Coffee is excited to announce the launch of their two new ready to drink cold brew coffee latte options. Don't settle for less. Make the switch now to Blackout Coffee. Head over to blackoutcoffee.com slash MK or use the code MK for 20% off your first order. Did you see, I'm not gonna name names, but there is a very woke, annoying company whose coffee's everywhere, who recently refused to advertise on any show that's right of center. Suffice it to say that blackout coffee doesn't feel that way. It's just absurd. Why are we giving our money to these companies that truly, they, it's not just they don't share our values, it's that they hate us. Uh, all right, don't do it. Go to blackoutcoffee.com slash MK. Just try it. See if you like, if you like it, you can both support a company that shares your values and have delicious coffee, which this is. Okay? Blackoutcoffee.com slash MK. Join the movement. Taste the difference. You're welcome. Now I'm joined by an excellent Minnesota reporter who knows Governor Tim Walz well. The controversies his campaign is embroiled in and his policies in her state, and she's been reporting on him for years. Uh, a new lie was revealed this week. You heard Sean Spicer reference it, the truth about what role, if any, IVF in vitro fertilization played in Governor Walz and his wife's family. Joining me now to discuss it all, Liz Collin. She's a journalist for Alpha News. Liz, welcome back to the show. Just as a reminder, we had Liz on when she dropped her documentary uh, on the Derek Chauvin trial and the absolute skewering of Chauvin and his fellow policemen in connection with the death of George Floyd. There is so much truth in this episode. It was uh, episode 670 on the documentary. Remind me of the exact name of the documentary, Liz. The Fall of Minneapolis, yep. The Fall of Minneapolis. I watched it, and how can people watch it? Because now they're gonna want to. Yeah, well, thank you for having me back on, uh, Megan. As you know, there was a lot of material we, we weren't even able to, to cover in our conversation before, but appreciate you having me back on to, to talk about all of this as so much has transpired here the last uh, couple weeks in Minnesota, but it's the fall of Minneapolis.com. People can watch it there for free. It's also on Rumble and on YouTube as well. Uh, many more people uh, have seen it now uh, since Governor Walls was, was tapped by Kamala Harris as his VP pick. Um, and, and really, this is sort of what this was even all about for us a, a couple years ago, just really pointing out the lack of leadership in this state that led to the worst riots in U.S. history. So you are, so the audience knows, um, an anchor at Alpha News. You're a multi-Emmy award-winning reporter and anchor, and you happen to live in Minnesota. You're married, you have a kid, you have a dog, you're a Minnesotan, and have been looking at this governor I think it's fair to say, and been rather alarmed at some of the lies he's been telling and policies he's been pushing. And so we want to go through them because, first of all, can I just get your overall reaction? It's amazing to me, even as cynical as I am about our media, how hard they're running cover for him. Do you think 
Do you feel the same? Yeah, it's actually not surprising being from here. I mean, you know a little bit of my my backstory, Megan, but I was a member of corporate media for nearly 15 years uh, in Minnesota. I'm from Minnesota. This is uh, you know where I was was born and and grew up. Um, and I really couldn't believe, you know, I traveled the country sort of working up the the ladder in in media and whatnot. Um, but how it, it, it seemed that the, the local stations, Minnesota's largest newspaper as well, uh, would just continue to, to run cover uh, for the, these Democrats, and especially uh, Governor Walls. I mean, you have a, a cabinet member of his, who is now the CEO of Minnesota's largest newspaper, the, the Star Tribune. And, I, you know, it's sort of, that's why I, I jumped out of corporate media, just tired of all of these these lies and not holding these these people accountable and, and you know, not informing the public about what's really going on, whether it's, you know, policy, uh, crime, a lot of these things that are radically changing are, are living here in, in Minnesota. And so that's why I jumped ship over to independent media in, in Alpha News and, you know, to talk about the, the riots and the Chauvin trial and, and whatnot, but it's so many subjects. And finally, I think that the media has been under fire and rightfully so uh, in Minnesota because all of these lies are finally uh, catching up to this guy because the, the press has has kept them hidden here locally for so long. Mm. The Star Tribune is a villain. They are a villainous actor who is not committed to reporting truth. That's very clear, but they're not alone. Um, let's just start going through them because I don't even know where to begin. There's so many, but let's start with the most recent, which is this IVF thing. Now, our audience may be familiar with the fact that in vitro fertilization is different from an IUI, um, intrauterine insemination. And I've told the story before that I had IVF three times when I had my three children. So I know this one very well. And I know people who have had IUI and I understand that one relatively well. And with all due respect to people who have gone through IUI, it is fair to say it is not as taxing, risky, or even ethically complicated as IVF is. And it's just, they're not the same thing. And there's no point in saying they're the same thing. Um, and the only reason to say they're the same thing appears to be in this case, because I don't think anybody in the history of womankind has lied about getting one when they in fact got the other, um, to say you got IVF when you really had IUI, political purposes could, could drive a man to do that. And that is my guess on what's happened here. Um, Tim Walls and his wife did not get IVF. They got IUI, the intrauterine insemination, where the man's sperm is injected into the woman via a catheter. Yesterday, I called it a turkey baster for short, but it's injected into the woman, um, you know, old fashioned style, like in the doctor's office. And then, and they help her with the ovulation too. And then they hope and pray that they get pregnant. It can be de devastating if they don't and so on. All due respect to those women. I'm not the one lying about your procedure, he is. Um, Exactly. IVF is very different where you have to go through multiple shots. They, they get your eggs to sort of grow inside of you. Then they have to extract the eggs, which is a painful uh, process for many. And then they ultimately fertilize the eggs outside of the womb. And then there's a second procedure where they reintroduce the fertilized embryo back into your body. And if you have excess embryos, you and your husband are faced with a real choice about what to do with those. Thank God we did not have uh, extras, so we didn't have to deal with it. But in any event, um, he is out there on record repeatedly saying that he and his wife, Gwen, got IVF, the more invasive, extensive, and ethically complicated one. Again, no judgment, I've done it myself. Um, and here he is, just to be clear, we've got a few sound bites, I wanna put it on the record so people know, there's no ambiguity. He said it, he said it over and over again. Um, mm -hmm. Here is, just a seven second one that's explicit on Pod Save America, July 30th. Yeah, well, first of all, it was up to him. I wouldn't have a family because of IVF and the things that we need to do reproductive. My kids were born through that direct, you know, that way. My kids were born through IVF. That he's ripping on JD Vance because he's peddling the lie. JD Vance doesn't support IVF. That's not true. He does, and he doesn't want any mm -hmm. bans. Here he is again. Um, this is July 25th on Jen Psaki's show. Today's IVF day. Thank God for IVF. My wife and I have two beautiful children. He thinks he needs to dictate that. And I've been saying this, the golden rule that makes small towns work so we're not at each other's throats all the time in a little town is mind your own damn business. I don't need him to tell me about my family. I don't need to tell him about my wife's health care and her reproductive rights. I don't need him telling my children what books they can read. He's fired to do that with whatever he wants, but I'm not interested in it. Here's another one, SOP 52 in Phoenix, Arizona, in August, August 9th. This one's personal for me. 
about IVF and reproductive care. When my wife and I, my wife of 30 years, when we wanted to have children, we went through years of fertility treatment. And I remember it was like it was yesterday, just waiting for good news. And then the phone would ring and you would be tensed up, and then you would hear that the treatments had failed. It, was a, it would blot out the sun that you just wanted something so beautiful and so simple to have a child. And then one day, and it wasn't by chance when that news came and we welcomed our daughter into the world. We named her Hope. We named her Hope. Look at him. He lies and then he overreacts. He, he, for the listening audience, he's touching his heart. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. My IVF story. Here's the last bit. Uh, the Harris campaign on August 6th tweeted out, sent out via paper statement, Governor Waltz and Mrs. Waltz have two children, Hope and Gus. Governor Waltz and Ms., Mrs. Waltz struggled with years of fertility challenges and had their daughter Hope through reproductive health care like IVF. Then... His campaign office, when he was still governor in April, mailed out a fundraising letter in an envelope that read, my wife and I used IVF to start a family. That's a quote. Mm -hmm. My wife and I used IVF to start a family. And now we're getting new reporting, clearly trying to get ahead of somebody who's about to break this, in the New York Times and CNN. The Times report begins many have assumed that his family relied on IVF. No, we did not We did not assume. We were directly informed by him and the Harris campaign that he did. None of us made assumptions about his child procreation methods. And then they go on to say, no, they are now clarifying from the campaign that they used IUI. So, the, by the way, the, the defense of all this uh, from the Walls campaign, Liz, is <laughs> Governor Walls, talks how normal people talk. He was using commonly understood shorthand for fertility treatments. Okay, you take it. Yeah, just a regular guy. This is how they keep trying to pass him off as. And it's amazing to me, even to watch your clips, Megan, about how he has so drastically changed uh, just in the last couple of weeks at these rallies and whatnot. These, this animated character, uh, he's all sort of jazzed up, coming out, bouncing around. I mean, this is a totally different person uh, than, than I've covered before. Um, it, it's wild to see uh, the, this transformation. Uh, but is that, that is right? exactly that's what it. they wait, do that's, with that's, him. That's, wait, wait, that's interesting because I want to get to the IVF so stuff, different. but like the, the yeah. whole, like I'm, he's kicking everything around and he's super enthusiastic. That's he, not how he's been. He's waving it. No, so, so different. Um, we've never seen this guy before. And that's, that's sort of the, the, the fodder among uh, local, local reporters and whatnot. Um, you know, many are leading his, his cheering section. They, you know, could not be more thrilled uh, for him as the, the selection. But for those of us who've actually uncovered a lot of this uh, years ago, saying, you know, why is he lying about that? That's the thing, even with this IUI, IVF, why would you lie about that? Um, and, and those are the, the questions, you know, even the, the command sergeant major rank, why are you lying about the rank you did not attain uh, in, in the military. Um, even this DUI story that, that we put out there years ago as well, um, you know, lying uh, about how he ha has hearing loss or how fast he's going and just so many of these lies that really make no sense. Right. So the, J.D. Vance picked up on exactly that. He posted on X. Today it came out that, that Tim Walls had lied about having a family via IVF. Who lies about something like that? Honestly, it seems almost pathological. Like, I understand he wanted to land a political hit on J.D. Vance to perpetuate the lie that he wants to ban IVF. It isn't true. I mean, they're like, he didn't make the vote that that mm -hmm. you would have preserved IVF. J.D. Vance's vote wouldn't have had, this is, actually, that's a different issue. They're, what they're trying to say about J.D. Vance is that he sponsor, that he's against um, IVF, and they're not pointing to the fact that he supported the Ted Cruz, Katie Britt bill to protect IVF. He didn't like the Democrats bill. He reported, he supported the Republicans bill. Anyway, um, so there's the IVF thing. I do want to go through them. We've got IUI and DUI. The DUI thing happened in <laughs> what year and what happened? 
Yeah, this was back in the early 90s when he was still in Nebraska, um, and he was he was going uh, nearly 100 miles an hour, about 40, 40 or 50 miles over the speed limit at the time, and uh, wasn't was intoxicated. Uh, but then later, when this pops up in a congressional uh, when he's when he's running for Congress, uh, his campaign manager basically says, uh, you know, that he was not intoxicated um, and he was being followed and he thought that was strange. And that's why he was going fast and blamed it on uh, some some hearing loss. I mean, the whole thing made absolutely no sense. And then we went back and we got the, the transcripts of the actual arrest itself. And I know ever since, too, that the state trooper has um, spoken out who actually arrested him back then. And there's no dispute that he was intoxicated. Uh, in fact, it's kind of what r- ran him out of Nebraska. He was so ashamed of this of this DUI and whatnot. He offered to resign his teaching position uh, at the time. And I think he did resign. Uh, he was coaching uh, a football um, at that time as well, and then stopped doing that in the wake of this, this DUI. Um, but but again, it, it just goes back to this. There was kind of a you know a, a mantra when he was running the, the second time around, especially uh, for governor Tim Walls lies. I mean, there was a reason that uh, that that became a thing a, a few years ago, and now finally he's facing the pressure of the, the national press, which is on a whole different level. That scrutiny he deserved for a very long time. And you see how these statements are coming out or you know, just, just trying to pass it off um, as it really there's nothing to see here. But there is, there, there is a, a pattern uh, here. And I've, I've recently talked to Tom Behrens again, who I know you've, you've spoken to as well. Um, he's the you command sergeant story. major who who took yeah who took Wall's place and that's what he says he says is this narcissism there seems to be something else going on with this guy uh, that he wasn't even aware of he just came forward and he remember remember Megan he actually went to Tim Walls first to say hey just stop using this rank he wrote a letter he went about it the right way uh, but for years you know he was uh, ignored and this unit was ignored which is why they've kind of you know done this full court press now at this point to say you know this guy's lying about that too Mm-hmm. All right. So sticking with the DUI for a second. Yes, he tried to excuse his driving in 96, right? In in a, what was, right. the, was the speed limit? I think it was um, 55. Yeah. In a 55 uh, by saying, okay, you know, by the way, and, and accused of being drunk. He tried to say, oh, the reason I didn't, I, I didn't pass the sobriety test was I had hearing difficulties that made it hard for me to understand what the officer was saying. And then it later came out that this field sobriety testing, quoting here from the Daily Beast, took place in the quiet of the officer's radio car on a deserted stretch of highway, 385 miles um, from Alliance and- and um, Yeah, in Nebraska. Okay. In the middle of and nowhere. And then- Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, he says that, yeah, the officer who, who they tracked down said, uh, saw drunk, arrested same. He just gave that statement recently, saw drunk, arrested same. So this cop is like, I'm not getting involved in this, but the guy was drunk. That's that. This is yet another falsehood. Um, yeah. can, can we just spend one minute on the coach thing? Because you mentioned he was a football coach in Nebraska. And she's talking about him on, you know, on the campaign trail, like he's Coach T from Friday Night Lights, you know, head coach down in Big South, who's like, bring it. What's the truth about that? He was an assistant coach um, at Mankato West High School uh, for a few years, but it, it is wild to me that I don't think a lot of assistant coaches would then use the title as coach. I mean, you see people <laughs> holding those signs, right, in the crowds. Yeah. That is also wild to me. Uh, why? What? <laughs> why? They, they say that they call him Coach Coach Walls. I, I've been in touch with a lot of uh, former students uh, just these, these last couple of weeks, and they say that you know, they, they didn't call him that. Maybe there are a, a couple here and there, but that that is also crazy to me. I mean, my husband is a, a assistant coach for sixth grade football. He doesn't demand that he be uh, called a called a coach. It's it's just crazy. <laughs> exactly. It's just like Jill Biden. She's also not a doctor, but insists that she be called it. What is it with these Democrats? All right. And so I'm like, military, how much money did they spend on on these uh, signs that they they are now handing out to to people to, course. you know, praise him exactly. as a coach? It's, it's wild. Soon we're going to have IVF signs um, and also not (laughs) DUI signs. Um, Let's talk about the military because there's a there's a there's a development in that today. Our audience by this point is familiar that he's been lying about his military record, elevating himself, saying he's a retired command sergeant major when he's not. He didn't earn the rank bailing on his unit right before they deployed to Iraq when he knew they were going to deploy. And he retired anyway, saying he used weapons 
like the ones at issue in war when he fought for Iraq. He never went to war. He went to Italy saying he served in Operation Enduring Freedom, which he didn't. That's the Afghanistan war. Again, only Italy. And over and over and over with all these things. There's like the evidence mounts of the number of times he did it every day. Um, today, we have a letter from 50 uh, military officers. Looks like all retired military officers um, and others and senators and so on um, to Governor Walz. And I'll read it in part. The office of the vice president is a position that requires the trust of the American people and a solemn commitment to duty on behalf of the U.S. As veterans who have served our nation, we feel compelled to address your egregious misrepresentations and urge you to come clean to the American people. You've stated you're damn proud of your service, and like any American veteran, you should be. But there's no honor in lying about the nature of your service, repeatedly claiming to be a retired, retired command sergeant major when you did not complete the requirements was not honorable, nor was it honorable to claim to carry weapons, quote, in war, when you had not served in war, and abandoning the men and women under your leadership just as they were getting ready to deploy was certainly not honorable either. To be blunt, when you falsely claim military service that did not happen and abandon your post, you diminish the real sacrifices made by veterans who did serve in combat. Military service is not merely a job or a uniform. Those who serve in the armed forces endure rigorous training, face perilous situations, and make sacrifices that most civilians can't comprehend. The honor of wearing the uniform is earned through dedication, bravery, and an unwavering sense of duty. You have displayed none of these characteristics as you've lied your way through a political career launched on the foundation of a title you did not earn and combat deployments you did not take part in. In short, our grave concern stems from the fact that the office of the vice president is one heartbeat away from becoming the commander in chief. You've already demonstrated your unwillingness to lead in a time of war and a lack of honor through your blatant misrepresentations, exploiting and co-opting the experiences of America's combat veterans for personal gain. That's remarkable. That is a tough, tough letter, Liz. And it's been put out, the, you know, the copy I have is put out by the Trump fans campaign. Obviously these are supporters of Trump and Vance, but it is not just partisans who are making these accusations or feel mm -hmm. betrayed by Tim Walz. Yeah, and that's a, that's an important point that I, I want to make also. This isn't just me coming coming on and, and talking about, um, you know, uh, what, what he's been doing in, in Minnesota. I've tried. I mean, I, I've been a, a reporter for 20 years. I know how this works. I can't even tell you, Megan, how many interviews I've requested uh, with Governor Walls over the years, and he has denied those requests. I'd love for him uh, to talk about uh, the riots. I'd love for him to talk about his, his military service. Uh, but but again and again, uh, you know, his his office will, you know, d decline or will, will just not respond uh, at all. So to me, that speaks volumes. And, and here we have sort of this standoff happening with, with so much of this information, uh, because he ha really has yet to sit down, I think, for a real interview um, over any of this. And, and there's a reason for that. There's also this, you know, lies by omission, uh, which is really a, really a thing here, too. I will say that, you know, being a, being a member of the press in Minnesota, it's interesting. I've been a part of press conferences uh, with him in the past. And uh, one, one story comes to mind. Somebody asked a question. You know, it was a, a good question that he should, should have answered. And uh, that person was, was quickly put in check by his uh, people to say, you know, that's a right-wing talking point. You can't ask that here. What? Um, but wow. that's kind of the understanding that you have um, with, with his office, which is just crazy. And that's why he really hasn't done much media, to be honest, in, in Minnesota in, in quite some time. I mean, sure, he's feeding stories to the, you know, Minnesota's uh, largest newspaper in this, the Star Tribune. Even, even them, I should point out, they went back uh, to previous stories about this IVF, and they've changed the headlines about how they're, they're covering that. And that's just happened in the last 24 me? hours. So you see, that, you see that manipulation happening. It's wild. That is so dishonest. That is disgusting. And there's no there's no editor's note or a, a change or anything along those lines. Oh my God! That I'm. It's just new lows are achieved daily by the corporate press in covering these Democrats and Trump for that mm -hmm. matter. They're just dishonest on both fronts. Um, on the military story, couple of new developments. Um, now we know that he issued a congressional coin. It's called a challenge <laughs> coin. That refers to himself as a retired command sergeant major. 
which he's not. You can see there uh, is the top left symbol uh, when checked against military rank insignia on defense.gov represents a command sergeant major. That's what he's holding himself out to be. And this is not unusual for, for members of Congress who served in the military to have one of these and to, and to you know give them. It's considered to be a great honor. Um, they're used across all branches of the military. Usually they're truthful. And usually our <laughs> servicemen and women don't falsely inflate, inflate their rank. But I mean, Liz, he did it everywhere. He, I can't find an instance of him saying yeah. the truth. I think it'll be pretty telling tonight, Megan, how this speech is going to go uh, at the DNC. In a way, it kind of seems there are a few elephants in the room to perhaps uh, address, but I, I, I guess if we're going to look at his, his past uh, track record, it will be uh, d deflection, and he'll, he'll really come off as, you know, this... Uh, you know, there's this great Midwesterner, um, you know, how he sell, sells himself. But yeah, the, the challenge coin was just, just one thing. And you've seen all the video clips of him re referring to this. He's a retired master sergeant. There's nothing to be ashamed of when it, when it comes to that. People certainly appreciate uh, service. But, you know, to, to feather your cap in the way that he has and use this rank, clearly, it seems, for political gain, uh, doesn't make much sense. Let me tell you how dishonest this is. Uh, this is just a small example, personal example. When I went from Fox to NBC, NBC put, put out like a bio, like Megyn Kelly is joining us and here is who she is. And one of the items in the bio said, among the people that I had interviewed, um, were Donald Trump, Barack Obama, et cetera. These left-wing zealots, so attentive to detail, called NBC by the dozen saying, when did she interview President Barack Obama? And NBC came to me and asked that question. I said, I never interviewed him as president. I interviewed him when he was senator and running for president. And NBC was like, oh, we have to add then senator. I'm like, okay, do what you want. I didn't misrepresent. I didn't, I never said, right? So anyway, um, right. fine. Okay. This same press has zero interest in the fact that the possible next vice president of the United States has misrepresented his rank in a command post over a unit that was deploying to Iraq over and over and notwithstanding the objections of the men in that unit who have been begging him to stop, Liz. Let me tell you about a headline the Star Tribune ran, actually, when we exposed this this story a, a couple of years ago when Tom Barron's first came forward in that an interview on his farm. Um, the, the, the headline was uh, Republican... Uh, candidate for governor who never served questions uh, Tim Wall's service or something along those lines. Uh, so oh. just think about how that, you know, that headline is is even framed uh, to try to control this narrative. Um, we, yeah, we saw a press conference. It was uh, Dr. Scott Jensen, who was running for governor at the time, and he brought uh, Tom Barron's forward to tell his story, and it received very little. I mean, it was maybe a 30 or 40 second uh, feature. Um, but, but meanwhile, you know, we see this treasure trove, essentially, of all of um, all of these instances, and, and Tom talked about that. You know, this was in uh, literature when he was uh, running running for Congress. Uh, th these were interviews that that he was saying this, and they just simply said, "Hey, dude, you know, could could you stop? Uh, this could have been, <laughs> you know, corrected very early on." But it does seem very odd that he decided to to stick with this, thinking this would not catch up to him. So that's why I also wonder, you know, I, I obviously they had to vet him in some way, but I can see if you go to Google and you, you type him in, it's going to be hard to find uh, some of this stuff because alternative media, as you know, is going to be, uh, you know, at the, at the very bottom if it's even going to come up at all. But these stories were all out there in some way, shape, or, her or form. Team, her team probably relied on the Star Tribune, which is their paper of choice, undoubtedly, and right. they got burned. Um, here's J.D. Vance responding on the challenge coin nonsense. Tim Walls said that he carried a weapon in war. He never went to war. Tim Walls said that he didn't know his unit was about to deploy to Iraq when even his own press release at the time said that he knew exactly that. Tim Walls claimed to be a command sergeant major, even had it printed on his challenge coins, and he knew he never achieved that rank. It's really, I mean, it's going to become an issue, and for sure we're going to be hearing about it at the vice presidential debate, Liz, which as far as you're telling me, may be the very first time Tim Walls is actually confronted face-to-face -face by somebody about all this. 
Well, I think you heard there was a reporter that that asked just on the tarmac, uh, I think it was last week, just kind of shouted, you know, what about stolen bell or what about that? And he quickly, quickly walked out. But I don't think he's been uh, confronted at all. Nobody at the, the Sheets gas station stop when they were shopping for Doritos uh, fired, <laughs> fired him the question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, he's going to have to he's going to have to to answer this uh, soon, you would think. Mm -hmm. All right. Now there's more because there's COVID. There's the lockdowns. Have you guys seen uh, um, the paintball? Like Tim Walz had cops fire paintball guns at his citizens, his own citizens post George Floyd so that they would obey the curfews. It's actually kind of nuts. I'm going to play you the video. We'll talk about it with Liz. What's true? What's not? And then we'll get into all of the gender, all the gender stuff, the crazy lunatic gender stuff he's been doing which the Star Tribune and others say isn't true. Liz stays with us. Quick break first. You know how much my family and I love our dogs. Strudwick, him too, always had a rough week. I'll update you soon. I can't imagine life without them. They have a great life, thank God, but some dogs are not so lucky. And that is why I'm so glad to tell you about Delta Rescue. This is the largest no-kill, care-for-life animal sanctuary in the world. They have rescued thousands of dogs, also cats and horses too. They provide all the animals with shelter, safety, and most of all, love. And they've been doing it now for more than 45 years. Delta Rescue relies solely on contributions to stay open, and giving can bring tax benefits to you as well. Speak with your estate planner about how you can grow your estate while helping animals in need. And check out the estate planning tab on their website if you want to learn more. We love our Thunder and Strudwick. Delta Rescue will help pups who need love too. Visit DeltaRescue.org today to learn more. That's DeltaRescue.org. Do you owe back taxes or have unfiled returns? Well, along with hiring tens of thousands of new agents and field officers this year, the IRS kicked off 2024 by sending over 5 million pay-up letters to those who have unfiled returns or balances owed. Don't waive your rights and speak with them on your own. That's a mistake. <laughs> Don't do it. Tax Network USA is a trusted tax relief firm and they've saved over $1 billion in back taxes for their clients, and they can help you secure the best deal possible. Whether you owe $10,000 or $10 million, they can help you. Whether it's business or personal taxes, even if you have the means to pay, or if you're on a fixed income, they can help. Finally, resolve your tax burdens once and for all. Call them at 800-245-6000. 1-800-245-6000. Or just visit tnusa.com slash Megan. Don't let the IRS control your life. Empower yourself with Tax Network USA support and take charge of your financial future. TNUSA.com slash Megan. Go there today. Liz, we pulled the Star Tribune headline that you referenced, and man, it this is so disturbing. So here is the headline from the Star Tribune uh, from March 13th. Governor Walls shares his family's IVF journey as Democrats look to guarantee access to treatments by Brianna Bierskbach. Okay, that's March. Shares his family's IVF journey as Democrats look to guarantee access to treatments. And now, same reporter, Governor Walls shares his family's fertility journey as Democrats look to guarantee access to treatments. Same reporter updated her earlier report to change the headline, you are correct, no editorial note, which is the mm -hmm. standard when you change editorial from what it once was to update it to something that's new and more and correct. That is a journalistic dereliction. How dare they? <laughs> I have a long history with the the, the Star Tribune and, and their lies, uh, no no doubt about it. And thankfully, uh, again, the fact that uh, you know Walls has been put in this position, um, it's really been shining a very bright light um, on that. You know, you, you know, as a as a journalist, you want to get to to the truth. This is what you know you're supposed you sign up for is sharing people's stories, but also uh, to inform the public and and tell them the truth. And I cannot tell you. Um, you know, how many lies that that paper has has helped to, to push. And it's a, a whole new level, um, even since, uh, you know, the, the, com the former commissioner um, of the Department of Economic uh, Development went over there, Wall's uh, good friend, uh, to, to run the place. The, um, the stuff around COVID, that's another thing. Um, he did favor lockdowns. He tried to dismiss it as, oh, the, the kids were never locked down. 
um, really more than like a few days, 10 days or something. That's an absolute lie. You lived it firsthand. He had Minnesota locked down for all of the spring of 2020 and for most of 2021, as far as I can see, Liz. Yeah, it basically went on for, for a couple of years. This is what's interesting, too, this uh, whole mind your own damn business. All of a sudden, this has become his his tagline. But yet he is the one that, that spearheads and sets up this snitch line where you can snitch on your neighbors uh, during <laughs> during COVID. And, uh, you know, I, I did a story. Uh, Lisa Zarza is her name. She's a business owner um, who had two uh, restaurants in, in Minnesota during this time. And she got so sick of these rolling lockdowns, she decided to open her doors and uh, open for 14 days defied this order and they came after her the state came after her hard they denied her uh, liquor license uh, for five years moving forward and she's now relocated she's now over in w wisconsin uh, to, to start over but they financially ruined her um as a result of, of standing up to, to this order there was also um you know different different things in, in minnesota that uh hospitals would would move covid patients into to nursing homes we had the highest uh, rate of deaths, I believe, in the country when it comes to nursing home deaths related uh, to, to COVID. So there were many uh, questions as to, to what he was doing uh, along the way. You know, again, the same person that we need to mind our own damn business, but yet we can't celebrate the holidays, uh, which was the case uh, under his orders, uh, you know, over Thanksgiving and, and Christmas and whatnot. Now there's video being circulated of uh, Joe, Joe Pags actually brought this to my attention of the aftermath of the George Floyd protest when Walls issued a curfew. You were supposed to be inside between 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. And this guy is such a tyrant when it comes to his executive authority. There is video of police officers in the streets on May 30th, 2020. And it's both National Guard and Minneapolis uh, police, although we believe that this is the Minneapolis police, actually shooting paintballs at residents who are just on their porches, USA Today reported on it back in 2020, for just being on their porches. Like that was considered a breaking of the curfew. Here's video. Get inside! Get inside! Get inside! Get your house now! Let's go! Light him up! Go inside now! Get, inside. Get in the house! <laughs> That is crazy. I don't know who issued the order to fire paintballs at residents, but it was his order in imposing that mandate, Liz. And I, I can certainly imagine an active governor like a, like a Glenn Youngkin firing every officer involved if they actually shot paintballs at residents sitting on their porches. That's exactly how mistakes happen and someone returns fire and a cop gets shot and so does a civilian. Well, I think there's important context here. Remember, this is May uh, 25th, 2020, uh, when George Floyd dies, and this is five days later. This is uh, Governor Walls, who is the first to take to the microphone, uh, call this a murder, uh, help to fan the flames, make this all about race and whatnot. Uh, this is Governor Walls, who d doesn't do anything, who withholds the National Guard, and also, you know, uh, doesn't allow the officers to, to wear their riot gear and, and whatnot. So then finally, when people are sick of, you know, businesses being burned down five days later, decides to, to really you know, go go after uh, this. It's just it's just crazy the timeline and what was allowed allowed to happen and all of the lies along the way that he was definitely the one uh, that that helped to push. And you know, this could have been the the time to take to the microphone and s stay calm. Hey, we're going to review the body camera footage. Why is the body camera footage actually hidden from the public? Um, probably, perhaps, because it didn't match up with what they were trying to, to sell uh, from that very next day, that this wasn't a part of training, this was a murder, uh, this had everything to do with race, you know, God, you know, God forbid we actually tell the truth that this was a mixed race group of officers and a black officer who arrested uh, George Floyd. So I could go on and on um, about about all of this. So uh, in, in so many ways, I think that the, the cops, um, you know, wanted to obviously do more right away. And then, you know, now they're kind of served up to the mob once again, when they when they were able to actually, you know, put a curfew in place and, and, and whatnot, as they were trying to do really from the very beginning to get these riots uh, under control. Unbelievable. So like he permits them, you can go ahead and 
shoot people on their porch with paintballs, but you cannot go out and bother the rioters because that could be mad. You could upset the rioters. I mean, that that really well, is actually, his attitude. Yeah, and he was actually saying, you you know, it, it's okay to go out and, and peacefully protest uh, during all of this. And this is the very first time in, in you know a couple months that he's obviously said that, you know, obey these these COVID orders, but yet go gather in large groups to, to protest. So it made no sense, the messaging uh, that was coming out of his office. We've, we've heard that from so many politicians. I remember living that. It was just infuriating. All right, let's talk about the radical gender ideology. I mean, because this guy, this is why I said when this broke, he's a wolf in sheep's clothing because he's super fun and he kicks his leg and he cheers and he touches his heart. Like, oh, I feel you. Oh, this is wonderful. And meantime, as far as I can tell, Tim Waltz can't get enough of allowing minors to chop off body parts and go on the dangerous medical course that sterilizes them. Even where their parents object, he will interfere so they can do it in Minnesota. Yeah, this is by far the most radical governor uh, we've ever had in, in Minnesota. Um, this trans refuge uh, law, as you're talking about, allows children uh, who, without uh, parental permission, uh, to seek, you know, this so-called gender-affirming care uh, in this state. And that's something that passed um, in St. Paul uh, at the, the, the state legis in, within the state legislative session uh, th this year that I think many people didn't really even know about. I mean, we were covering it daily um, over here at Alpha News. Uh, but for the most part, uh, you know, if the Star Tribune uh, was reporting it, you were lied to about that uh, as well. And I know you've, you've talked about, you know, the tampons in boys' bathrooms, which has become um, such, a, you know, a hot topic now, which is completely reality. These these uh, legislators rejecting Republican amendments to, to limit these menstrual products just to female bathrooms. Um, and you hear again and again in the, in the testimony from the uh, lead author of this bill who says no. Um, you know, basically these need to go in, in boys' bathrooms as well. I know you've played the clips on, on your show too. These are their own words. There's kind of this uh, debate now between, you know, spirit of the law, letter of the law. But if you take a look at the actual um, hearing itself, and we were, you know, putting these clips out on X and putting them out on social media so people can just hear these conversations for yourself. Because even, you know, five years ago, could you even imagine that this would be discussed in your <laughs> in your state capitol? Uh, but I can't tell you how very little attention that received at the time. And now you have the, the local media twisting themselves up into pretzels once again to try to sell this, that this didn't happen. Yes, it did. That It's actually in the bill. It is 100% in the bill. And I like, I defy anybody there. The, all these people trying to fact check me are not lawyers. Read the letter of the statute. It is there, black and white, on what they are allowed to do, what they must do. And there is a mandate that you provide these products in all bathrooms used by menstruating students. And if you have a, quote, trans boy, which means girl pretending to be a boy, and this girl uses the boy's bathroom, and you don't have a gender neutral bathroom, guess what? The tampons must, under the letter of the law, be placed in there. That's the letter. And as you point out, this is what the sponsor of the law said. This very thing came up. Here's SOT 57, for those of you who haven't heard it. So the products must be available to all menstruating students. I think there was some discussion earlier about um, boys' bathrooms. Would that allow a school district, at least in the, especially in the elementary age, to not have to put men's these products into the, the male, the boys' bathroom. Um, this bill requires that schools provide free period products in all student bathrooms grades four through 12. Trans boys menstruate and they use boys' bathrooms and would need these products in order to ensure that all menstruating students have full access to period products, it is important that we include them in all bathrooms where trans students who menstruate may need to access them. That's it. I mean, it's just done. And now what's happening is you've got like CNN saying, well, of the 300 Minnesota districts, we talked to 15 who are only putting them in girls' rooms and gender neutral bathrooms. And they notoriously skirt the issue of, first of all, what about the 285 other jurisdictions? <laughs> and what about the jurisdictions that do not have a gender neutral bathroom? What are they doing? And what about the jurisdictions that don't have a gender neutral bathroom and have a so-called trans boy? Because you heard Sandra Feist, the representative who sponsored the whole bill say, 
that girl pretending to be a boy needs her period products in the boy's room. Yeah, it, it is so crazy to me, even hearing that clip, which I've probably listened to it a, a hundred times at this point. I just can't even believe that this is real life. Uh, <laughs> these are the conversations Same. that we're having. And people and people think that this is the right road to, to go down um, is is really uh, wild to me. And I, I will say over at Alpha News, we've covered so many people. I did a whole segment about, you know, uh, people who've left Minnesota and their reasons for it. And Tim Walls is always up there uh, within their, their top reasons. Now, remember, he didn't even actually carry his... His uh, congressional district uh, when, when elected uh, as governor this second time around. You know, rural Minnesota has really uh, turned uh, on him for, for these lies and, and pushing these progressive policies. It's interesting, I've kind of been helping some national news crews to, you know, find people to talk to. And uh, there was a reporter who went down to southern Minnesota who said she talked probably a hundred people at an event and she could not find one person to say anything nice uh, about this guy. And you also actually even have um, the, the press going to his home state of Nebraska that I've been reading comments from as well. And uh, they're struggling to find anybody. They all say, you know, great, he's from here, but I'm not going to be voting for this guy. Um, and mm -hmm. there's still so many more skeletons, I think, in his closet. And I know you've talked about his ties to China, and there, there's so much more uh, there. It's interesting. I'm not sure if the guy actually even knows uh, who he is himself, as we've seen him kind of take on this uh, chameleon-like uh, caricature, even at the, these rallies these, these last couple of weeks. Again, not something you ever saw in, in Minnesota. The ties to China run deep. Uh, really deep. Like he's been there, what, 30 times? He was taking students over there once a year on a trip that was sponsored in part by the Chinese uh, Communist Party. He uh, got married on the anniversary of Tian Tiananmen Square because he always wanted to remember the date of his wedding. There's a lot, there's a lot there, Liz. Yeah, I actually just uh, published a story this past weekend. I encourage people to, to read it, but this is an interview with a student um, who, who spent time with uh, Tim Walls in China on one of those trips for nearly two and a half months. Uh, but he talks about how he collected the, the little red books, the, the Mao books, um, and would talk openly about that, saying that he would give them as, as souvenirs. And he saw him buy at, you know, more than a dozen in his time there and was really struck. Um, he says, you know, he's a Maoist at his core. That's how he d described Tim Walls. Um, basically, you know, kind of fawning over communism, even at their, their time there. They're about 10 years apart. So this was a 20-some-year-old at the time when he was uh, taking the trip with, with Tim Wall. So it was really interesting to, to hear this person. And he said that he's been trying to get even this story out there when he, he saw him running for Congress and, and governor, uh, but nobody was interested. Uh, he said he's told these stories about his interactions with Tim Walls on that trip so many times, but now all of a sudden, you know, people are interested in, in hearing ab about that. And, and the similarities between the Little Red Book and some of the things we're hearing on the campaign, this Mao brings joy, Kamala brings joy. It's a direct uh, comparison uh, of, to, to things that are actually uh, in there, and you can see it, see it for yourself. He, um, on the China front, according to the Free Beacon, they did great reporting too, and they reported that as a high school teacher in the 1990s, he appeared to extol life under the Chinese communist regime, telling his students that it's a system in which everyone shares. They mm -hmm. share, Liz. They get free food and housing. And um, this is during a lesson. This is reported in a magazine at the time. Uh, the doctor and the construction worker, they make the same and get food and housing. Uh, reported in the 1991 article in Nebraska's Alliance Times Herald. Um, he's always been fascinated by communist China, according to the profile about him. And he wrote about feeling like a king. He was treated like a king in China. He got a salary that was double the pay of the Chinese teachers. He was given a decorated apartment with a color TV. He had the only air conditioned residence on campus. I'll never be treated that well again, he said. They gave me more gifts than I could bring home. I mean, there are now congressional questions being asked. James Comer, obviously this guy is a Republican who does not want to see Tim Walls elected, but he's actually filing an inquiry, an official inquiry to dig to the bottom of just how close are these ties what was the nature of these gifts? Um, how, why have you gone there so many times and seem to be so enamored with the Chinese system, which you know, you're know you on camera saying just recently that socialism is another person's neighborliness. Um, mm. So just what do we need to know about what, if anything, he's been doing for China? 
Yeah, and I think there, you know, there's some questions to be answered. He was in the guard at the time, uh, you know, a military member. Uh, so that's interesting timing as well. But this student says, you know, what's different here is this guy really believes this in his heart. Um, and he knew that and he kind of kept in touch with them actually even after this trip. Um, and, and really was very troubled uh, by all of this. And it sort of took on this whole new life, knowing that he, you know, would be running for, for office and, and thought he needed to, to talk more about this and, and sound the alarm. Uh, but he says, you know, he called him the Manchurian candidate, unlike we've ever seen before. Um, a, that he really does believe this in his heart. And if you look at the comments, and to me, this almost kind of made a little bit more sense now with the riots and uh, things that happened under his watch that, oh, perhaps uh, this, is, this, this is really his belief system, but we're just now uh, hearing about these, these connections. It's really incredible. And it does make you wonder whether they, they, they vetted the guy, but let's face it, they really didn't even vet her so he's probably the least of their problems. Who knows what's going to come out on Kamala Harris? Mark Halpern was on the show recently saying that's one of the big concerns among some top Democrats is, you know, how well do we know her history? She was raised by Marxists. It's no accident in my mind that she chose him. Um, I think she's telling us who she is. Liz, thank you. You're, you're great. Love Alpha News. Everyone should follow them on Twitter, too. It's a great follow. Thank you, Megan. I really appreciate you having me. All the best. Tomorrow, uh, we will have full reaction to Bill Clinton and Tim Wall speaking tonight, and we will have my friend Tucker Carlson here to do that. See you then.